Okay, R Ricardo mentioned that uh, before I came here to Harvard to be a professor of human evolutionary biology, I was uh, both a professor of psychology and economics at the University of British Columbia. And this book is in part uh, an outcome of nine years in an economics department where I tried to convince my colleagues in economics that they had elegant theories, but they began with the wrong theory of human nature. So this was my effort to, to try to redress that phenomena. Um, so I'm going to begin with a puzzle, and it's the puzzle of our species' uh, ecological success. So long before the origins of agriculture, or the first cities, or the first industrial technology, our species expanded out of Africa. About 100,000 years ago, we expanded across Eurasia. By 60,000 years ago, we're in Australia. Sometime after 50,000 years ago, we enter, enter Europe. Uh, 40,000 years ago, there's uh, humans living in the Arctic, and then eventually into the New World, all the way down to the tip of Tierra del Fuego uh, by about 18,000 years ago. The, the numbers actually here are, need to be updated. Um, now, in expanding to all these diverse environments, humans uh, have to adapt somehow to this immense diversity of environments. In fact, humans have adapted to a greater diversity of environments than any other terrestrial species. And the, the interesting part is that we've done it with very few genetic, uh, location-specific genetic adaptations. So as a species, despite our, the immense number of environments we live in, we're only moderately genetically diverse and, and not very genetic diverse at all for a species with all our different environments. If you compare our species to another very successful species, the most successful invertebrate, ants, um, they took the usual route, the standard route, which was that they speciated into over 14,000 different species with a uh, dizzying array of different adaptations for different kinds of environments. But we somehow did it without that. Now, the question is, how did we do it? Now, one of the reasons why this may have never been problematized in your mind, and, and people don't often ask this question, is because there's a kind of easy automatic response. And that response is that we're smart. We have big brains, and we think that these big brains are capable of solving problems. So we just apply the big brains, and we get the solutions. Now, Ricardo alluded to my, my favorite stories of lost European explorers. Sometimes the, the lost folks are Americans. And uh, in this case, I'm not going to go to the Arctic. I'm going to go to Australia, to the Burke and Wills expedition. So if you're from Australia, you know about Burke and Wills. If, if you're not from Australia, you probably don't. So this is an expedition to cross the interior of Australia for the first time by Europeans, going from Melbourne up to the Gulf of Carpentaria, and back was the goal. Now, I want to make a long story short here. Uh, our, our heroes, Burke, Wills, and their expedition, they, uh, they make it down to here back on their way back, and they get stuck in Cooper's Creek. And they had had some camels, and their camels got lost along the way. And they were down to their last camel, and they're traveling along Cooper's Creek on a last-ditch effort to save themselves when they're trapped in the outback. And they're heading, prophetically enough, to a mountain called Mount Hopeless. <laughs> uh, and traveling along the, the creek, and their last camel dies. So now they're stranded along the creek because there's a good stretch of open desert that they have to cross before getting to the ranch and police post at Mount Hopeless. So they're trapped, and they're just waiting for a rescue expedition to come from Melbourne. Now they're trying to find food and survive as hunter-gatherers. And remember, our species survive for th uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years as hunter-gatherers. So they're kind of faced with the basic problems that have dominated human evolutionary history. But they you know, they're, can't find water in the desert, they can't hunt, they can't fish. But they do encounter some of the locals. So as I mentioned, humans have been in Australia for 60,000 years. And they're able to get some gifts of fish from the local Yawantru tribe. And while they're in one of the camps, they see the women grinding up these sporocarps and, you know, to make flour. And they're like good Victorian Europeans, uh, Englishmen. So they figure they can make bread. And they are able to finally, it takes a while of searching, but they locate the sporocarp. And they grind it up. And they bake muffins. And they make gruel and whatnot. And it looks, things are looking good. It seems like they're going to be able to get enough calories because there's tons of this stuff around. Now, the problem was is that they didn't notice or didn't attend to the fact that the women had some tacit knowledge. So they were uh, grinding, leaching, and heating the, the nardu. And then they were only eating it with a mussel shell. Or they were grinding, leaching, and baking it in ash. And this turns out to be a crucial element of food processing uh, that the Yawantru know about because nardu is toxic and indigestible unless properly processed. It's full of an enzyme called thiamines, which will deplete all the B1 in your body and give you a horrible condition called beriberi. So these poor guys were eating all this nardu, but it wasn't, it wasn't getting processed by their body, so they're starving to death on a full stomach. And uh, they're also gradually getting beriberi. And, and William Wills is writing about all this in his journals, which they later found. So you can actually read William describing beriberi as he gets it and then starving to death. 
Um, so these uh, two guys poisoned themselves. Now the third member of their party named King wandered off into the desert delirious and was rescued by the Iwantru and eventually by the folks in Melbourne. So we have the story from those two sources. Now this, this case of lost European explorers tells us that you know whatever it is that we have these big brains for, it doesn't seem to be for surviving as hunter-gatherers. No, no instincts kicked in, no modules fired up that allow us to, to make fire or to cook or to hunt or to do all the things we need to do to survive. So there was no, no general intelligence bailed it out. They weren't able to so survive, uh, solve the basic problems of survival in the desert. They couldn't find water or identify edible plants. Uh, I, I mentioned that there, there were some camels, and th they let some camels go. And so the camels were also faced with the lost European explorer challenge in the <laughs> desert. Now, if you know about Australia, you know that central Australia is now filled with feral camels from Burke and Will's expedition. So the camels survived the lost European explorer challenge, but, but Burke and Will's didn't. And the camel can do it because it's equipped with powerful ways of detoxify, de detoxifying plants. Um, it can smell protein in particular plants, so it has these taste cues that it used to f uses to figure out what to eat. And it can also smell water from a mile away. So it's got all these instincts that just kicked in and allowed it to survive, but not the case of the humans. And this, this, I like this inconspicuous plant. Uh, in, you'll find it in the Australian outback. It's called spiniflex. And it looks inconspicuous, but if you know about this, you know that you can beat it, and then you get these little crystals off of it, which you can mix with kangaroo dung, not wallaby dung, uh, and then heat it, and it'll make a powerful adhesive that you can use to make tools. But it's the kind of thing that's hard to figure out, but easy once you know. So the point was, these guys, they were missing something. And what they were missing was a large body of cumulative know-how, like how to use spiniflex and how to find water in the desert, that for most adolescents in the Iwantru tribe is just bequeathed to them. It's free information that allows them to survive in the desert. But Burke and Wills, despite their big brains, could survive without that uh, crucial knowledge. All right, so that suggests there's something, our brains might not be for exactly what we think they're for, since we're so dependent on this large body of know-how, even to survive as hunter-gatherers. Now, I want to come at this from another angle. So this is research by Esther Herman and Mike Tomasello at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. And what these comparative psychologists did was they had a competition between three primate species. So orangutans, chimpanzees, and two and a half year old human children. I put a picture of my two and a half year old son as a stand in. Uh, he wasn't actually in the experiment, but his, but his peers were, the other two and a half year olds. Uh, and this is the percent correct on a battery of cognitive tests. Now, 18 different cognitive tests, uh, hundreds of participants in each category. And this is the scores they got. So the two and a half year, uh, human children on this subset of tests about space, trying to solve these different problems. And when you solve the problem, you get a snack. And all three species like snacks. Now, the human children don't do much better than the chimpanzees uh, on the space, and the orangs do a little worse, but not a lot worse. And again, here the chimps are edging them out, although, you know, uh, within the margin of error, uh, orangs a little worse. And same thing here. The only place where the human children seem to just go to ceiling and the kids go to floor is in the social learning tasks. And in fact, it took Esther and Mike a while to come up with a task where the kids weren't just pinned against 100% and the apes weren't pinned against floor. They needed a test that they could show that some apes could solve, some, some non-human apes. Uh, so this suggests, well, at least as terms of basic equipment, this equipment doesn't seem to be that much better, but this equipment seems really stunning. And I could show you more evidence like this. So for example, in tests of working memory, chimps can compete with undergraduates. Um, in tests of strategic thinking, where you got to kind of anticipate what your, what your opponent's going to do and try to you know, do with something that, that allows you to beat them, uh, chimps will go to the Nash equilibrium. So Leslie mentioned the Nash. Chimps get there quickly. Humans just keep missing it. They sort of systematically missing it. So we don't seem to be strategic thinking. Now one interesting thing that hints at where I'm going is that these human children, they had to use these two and a half year olds. You might think it's unfair, you could have put some adult humans in there. If you'd put adult humans in there, they would have blown the roof off, right? They would have completely crushed the chimps. But that's because these little guys are going to keep getting better at these cognitive abilities well into their third decade of life. Meanwhile, the apes, the four year olds are as good as it gets. You're, you're not going to get smarter when you're 15, 30, and chimps live to 50 or so, just flat across the age. So something about the human growing up, their world allows them to get smarter and smarter, at least on these cognitive tests. 
So the point of these experiments is that the secret of our success, I'll argue, is not our intelligence but our culture. The fact that we can learn from each other and this body of knowledge that we learn from each other accumulates over generations so that one generation bequeaths it. And over generations outside of conscious awareness this will produce what I'll call cultural adaptations. Uh, now, um, uh, some key elements in this are high fidelity cultural transmission, so good copiers, the opposite of intelligence, and sociality. So uh, uh, humans have to be able to interact with each other to learn this, and this really powers the system. And this gives rise to what I call collective brains. So the idea is that humans are dependent on populations for producing all of our tools, technology, and know-how. So larger, more interconnected populations produce know how faster and they have a higher equilibrium level, a higher kind of steady state level of know how and larger toolkits. And this actually, uh, I argue, had drove genetic evolution. So this second system of inheritance, cultural transmission rooted in human learning, actually heavily influenced our genetic evolution. So we're a, uh, a mixture of genes and culture coevolution. Now, one of the problems within uh, the evolutionary sciences, at least as they apply to humans, is there's often a dichotomy between culture and genetic evolution. These are thought of as two different explanations. The approach that I'm laying out here is that we should use the power of natural selection to think about how it shaped our minds to make us better social learners. And so it, natural selection shapes our capacities, the genes for our learning abilities, which then gives rise to this cultural evolution. And of course, this can then feed back on our genetic evolution. Okay, now humans use, we, there's a great deal of evidence that humans use a wide range of, of uh, specialized learning abilities. So from a very young age, children will use cues of success, skill, competence, prestige. They'll use the age of the people they're learning from, things about what dialect they speak and ethnicity to key in and only learn on certain members of their social group. And this is a selective process that allows information to accumulate over generations. And we also know that this applies to a wide range of domains. So children will learn all kinds of different things. Uh, this develops early. We can see it in one-year-olds. Okay, now these things can generate cultural adaptation. So uh, these capacities, uh, so natural selection gives rise to these capacities for social learning, and this unconscious process of selection gives rise to complex adaptations. I'll just mention one, uh, which some, some of you might be familiar with, is nixtamalization. So in pre-Columbian North America, we find that uh, populations who are dependent on corn mix like burnt seashells or ash from a wood fire into the corn mix. And it turns out this is crucial because if you live on corn and you don't mix an alkali into the uh, mix, which creates a chemical reaction, you'll end up with a horrible disease called pellagra. But if you put this ash into the corn mix, it releases the otherwise unavailable niacin and uh, allows you to avoid pellagra. Uh, so it's an example of an unconscious thing that has accumulated that people themselves didn't understand that's hard to figure out. In the case of nixtamalization, we know that it was hard to figure out because the Europeans took corn over to Europe and there were uh, epidemics of pellagra and no, no one could figure it out for, for quite a while. So um, these uh, larger interconnected populations, if that's true, we should see more complex tools in uh, larger populations. So Rob Boyd and Michelle Klein collected data on the complexity of foraging tools from societies throughout Oceania, so before the Europeans arrive or are right at the edge of contact. So all different places. And these are nice because they're isolated pockets that allows you to compare populations of different size. And what you find is that as the populations get bigger, you get more different kinds of tools, more uh, spears and more uh, fishing nets and more types of fish hooks. And they get more complex, so they have more parts. Um, across these different islands. And the more interconnected islands seem to do even better. All right, so uh, now the problem with that last one is it doesn't actually get at whether those things are caused, so they should only co correlated. So we went to the lab and we set up two experiments um, in which we had different generations uh, pass information down the line. And in one experiment, one individual just passed it to the next, just passed it to the next. And in this other setup, each individual in each generation in the laboratory could learn from anyone in the previous generation. So they had a wider set of social models. They were more interconnected. Now, so they were, uh, and they were trying to copy this image. All right. Uh, so then after they had their time, they got paid for their performance and their performance for any of their students, they could write up to two pages and pass it down uh, to their students. And then the next generation got the product, whatever they made that looked like this, um, the product write up and uh, the, the actual target. So they had this. 
so we can measure their skill. And over 10 laboratory generations, just as one individual passes information along, you find when you can only learn from one person and you're not well interconnected, you actually have no increase in skill. That's the blue line. But when you can learn from five other people, the thing just rockets up. And you end up with people who are up at 80 or 90 percent skill, as opposed to these guys who are around 40 percent skill. So just within the lab, we can generate more skilled individuals. Yeah. You can really see it on this plot. So these are the generations that, as you go down. And this is the, the actual things that they made. And you can see this, these guys had a good first generation, not so good here. Uh, but then these guys just take off, because they're learning from each other. And by the time you get to here, the worst guy in generation 10 is better than the best guy here, just because of the accumulation of knowledge. People are, are randomly assigned. All right, so the main idea here is that uh, cultural evolution is going independent of genetic evolution. and actually drives the process to give us larger and larger brains that are better at acquiring, storing, and processing information that we acquire from other people, because that's the name of the game if you want to survive in a world of cumulative cultural evolution. Now, one of the key things that happens over human evolutionary history is our, our heads hit the stops. We can't get any larger brains. And we have to begin to have a division of labor between males and females. So when you study small scale societies, there's often males have one specialization and females have another. So this is the first time at which the, beginning, the division of labor begins because we can't store all the information in one person's head. Now, I won't go through this uh, slide. I'm, I'm out of time. But this is just an example of how cultural evolution produces a bunch of products which end up then shaping our psychology and changing how we think and changing our bodies, giving us uh, springy arches and altering our digestive system because of the things that are produced by cumulative cultural evolution. All right, that's it. Very good.